that um, stipulates that if a person um, drinks alcohol, um, then that person is, has lost their salvation or that person is going to hell. So we know the basis, we know the basis for salvation. You should know that, okay? You should know that. We know the basis for what salvation is. Okay, so what is the aim of this, of this teaching? Once again, also, there is no Bible verse that makes it very clear um, that, you know, drinking, um, um, now we have to, we, drinking, now we have to put it in two categories. We have got liquor. You have to know the difference between the two. There is liquor, okay? There is liquor, okay? And then, of course, and then there's also alcoholic wine. And I would have to make um, the assertions or the explanation clear before we go on so we know what we are talking about, okay? Now, liquor has got alcohol percentage, which ranges or anything that is the alcohol percentage in the liquor is excessive, okay? So we've got, um, we've got alcohol that is ranging from anything that is above, that, that is my research, okay? Anything that is above 15% onwards is considered as excessive. However, however, depending on everybody's metabolism, there are some people even when the alcohol percentage is even 2%, they get even tipsy. Some people, when the alcohol percentage is 3%, they get tipsy. Some people, when the alcohol percentage is 10%, they get tipsy. Some people, when the alcohol percentage is 20%, they get tipsy. Some people, 40 and so on. So what the, this teaching is driving at here, I want to, you to get the, a little bit of the end before I go so your mind is clear. What the teaching is driving at again is that there, there are three areas when it comes to, when it comes to um, alcohol. One, the first level is outright strong alcohol, which is called liquor. Liquor. That one, the alcohol percentage is very high. So you've got, you've got drinks like a whiskey, brandy, you know, then every country has got, in Africa, every country has got their local brewed um, um, alcohol. In my country, we've got a very strong one that we call it aquitation. You know, so everybody has got their name. Some call it Kai Kai, some call it Kutuku. So, <laughs> some, some call it kill me quick. In other words, the moment you take it, instantly the, 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 the effect and the impact is instant. Some people get goosebumps. Some people start to sweat. Some people, I mean, it's just, it's just, it means that their concoction is very dangerous, you know, and it has serious side effects. So we've got strong liquor. I want to make that clear before we go on. Now, that one, the Bible makes it clear in the book of Proverbs. It says that strong liquor, anyone that takes strong liquor is not wise. Okay? And it always ends bad. I've just paraphrased it. There are so many Bible verses in Proverbs. I'm not going to that now. So strong liquor, he said, that anybody that takes strong liquor is not wise. Why is he saying you are not wise? Because the moment you take strong liquor, your senses are suspended. And you start behaving in way. I mean, I mean, there are some people they say they don't even know how they they got they, they got back home. You know, why would you why would you go into something that suspends your senses? You know, okay, so that is that. That's that's that side, the liquor. Then now we've come to wine, wine that has got varying degrees. That's where we, we, st we started off last week. Varying degrees of alcohol content. The longer it is stored, the higher the content. Okay, so wine itself comes from a, a, comes from grapes. It's grapes. They take the juice out. But drinking it like that on its own will not do anything. But what makes the what makes what brings about the the intoxication is the level of alcohol. And how, how, how does alcohol get into it? They can get alcohol into wine by two ways. By industrial, by industrial alcohol that they induce it, they put some chemicals into it to increase the alcohol content or by storage or by storage. So when you store grapes over a period of time, it begins to ferment because in the grapes, there's sugar. The sugar decomposes, okay? And the sugar becomes molasses. Then the molasses ferments and then turns to alcohol. So, for example, our local farmers in Africa, where who tap the tap palm wine, you know, if you, if you have gone to the village before, when they bring the tap palm wine and they bring it out of the bottom of the plant of the palm tree, it is fresh. 
That one, you can drink and drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. It will take a long time before it gets the person drunk. But now when they store it in the pot and they leave it for two days, three days, four days, then the fermentation process gets stronger. See that? So when you go to the local people, you, you, you hear people saying, okay, give me the palm wine that is one week old. Give me the palm wine that is fresh. So it is the fermentation that has made it become alcoholic. Okay. Now, if, so far from what we have read and what we have studied, it is, it is the level of intoxication that we are dealing with now. But because, because, now that is coming to our, after strong drink, strong drink, the Bible completely condemns it outright. So when we come out strong, we are talking about the alcohol content is very high, very high. So things like um, uh, Jack Daniels and um, brandies, whiskeys, they are very deadly. They are very, very now, not, not, not only is it that they are deadly, it's not good for you, but even biologically or, or, or health-wise, it could be very dangerous. You can develop, you know, pancreatitis, you can develop liver problems. A lot of people have drunk strong drink and their liver has been damaged. Their liver has been damaged. It can cause you kidney problems. It can cause you intestinal problems. It can cause you serious problems. Now, everybody's body is different. Somebody say, oh, you know, I don't believe that. You still keep on thinking, oh, once in a while, does not help. But the point is, this is where this, is where the, this lesson is driving at. The lesson here that is driving at is that where, where is, who, what is excess? Because excess for Jane will be different from excess to Peter. And because a person might not know their level, see, that is why if you watch the advice, then it's, it's best to abstain. So we are dealing with ab abstinence because you cannot know where you go beyond your border. Do we, do we all agree on that? So let us clear that air first. Liquor. It's that one, the Bible contains liquor completely in Proverbs. Liquor. Liquor is the aqua content is too high. But when it comes to wine, there are levels of alcohol content. Okay? There are levels. But once the level goes beyond, beyond something that is excessive, then it is becoming a liquor now. But because you, you don't know, you don't know. Somebody will say, oh, you know, you know, I, I have, you know, a little one does not hurt. Yeah, but the point is that the little one can be two, two can be three, three can be four, and then it goes on. So in, in the wisdom that the Bible is talking about is that, you know, abstain because you don't know your level. Okay, so we, we, I hope we get that clear. So let me continue to where we, 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 we got to. So we gave examples of Noah. Noah drank and all that. We, we went all the way through. Jesus was at a wedding where, where wine was served. That, that wine that Jesus they turned into had some alcohol content, but it was not excessive for it, for it, it was not excessive for it to be called, categorized as liquor. Okay, right. But the essence in that miracle of Jesus turning water into wine was not because he wants us to have the liberty in wine. He was passing across a spiritual message, which most people, most people miss. See, he was talking about how eventually he would change the state of a man's spirit from Adamic nature to the nature of Christ. That is why he performed that miracle, to show that it is only him that can be able to do that. Okay, so let me go from that area here, starting from this area here. So Jesus' miracle at the wedding of Cana need not throw us off balance as, as um, in terms of, you know, um, because some people read that and say about for Jesus 10, what time 12, as an endorsement for alcohol or wine. Rather, just like all of his miracles, he points us to his redemptive work where we see the true wine which is his blood, the true wine, which is his spirit. You see that now? You see? You see? So if you don't look at it, that's why every Bible passage must focus on Christ. Luke 24, he said that, oh fools, verse 24, and slow of heart, you do not believe what the prophets wrote, that everything that has been written from the writings of Moses to the prophets and the Psalms concerning me in the area of what I will do to sin, so when people read the Bible and they see things like this and they make it relate to something else and they miss the target that it is referring 
to the death, burial, and, Christ, of, and the resurrection of Christ, that is where it gets very bad. So you see that here, the purpose of Jesus turning water into wine was that wine was a figure of speech to point to the blood, which is a spirit, which will save us. Can you see that? So this, in essence, helps the believer to see why the reference of wine in epistles was in respect to the spirit. So the epistles explains the, the new, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Old Testament. Look at Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. What, what is Old English? What it means that a person gets drunk when the wine is too much. And, the, and even though the alcohol content may be 2%, do you know that if I take alcohol content, which is at 2%, 5%, and I take it a lot, do the maths. If I take if one glass has 2% or 5%, I take a second glass, that is 5 plus 5, 10. A third glass, 15% inside my belly. Another glass, 20%. So I've got 20% now. And then after the third glass or the fourth glass, the person starts feeling whoop, tipsy. Okay. So what he means is that wine will get you drunk when it is in excess. Wine will get you drunk when it is too much. Okay, except the alcohol content is very, 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 very low. But he said, and do not be and be not drunk with wine wherein wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Well, why do people uh, why, why do people want to drink wine? Well, they say they want to be merry. M-E-R-R-Y. They want to be excited. Well, you can get excitement from the Holy Spirit. You can pray so much in tongues that it charges your spirit and causes you to be excited. Haven't you spoken in tongues about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour and after it? You felt so elated. You felt so lifted. You felt so like some the, the weight on your shoulders was lifted up. The same effect that wine can give you, the Holy Spirit can give you the same. That is why in the book of Acts, when they were speaking in tongues, the people that came there thought that they were drunk with wine. Because you can, you, the anointing can make you act, behave like you are, you are drunk. See, there's something called being drunk in the spirit. Okay, so that is the meaning of that. Okay, so we, we, we dealt with that. I want to move on to something else uh, in that regard, coming back to that, re, that area. Okay. So once again, in the Ephesians 5, 18 and the 19, Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, is the effect when a person is full of the Spirit. Is the effect when a person is full of the Spirit. When a person is full of the Spirit, they are merry. See that? When a person is full of the Spirit, they are merry. They are excited. That is what he's trying to say. When a person is full of the spirit, they are it creates excitement. You are married. That is what he's trying to say. Because it follows after the verse 18. Do not be drunk in wine wherein it is in excess. Okay? But be filled with the spirit. Verse 19 of Ephesians 5. For those who joined us, we are still answering the question from last week whether. Uh, uh, is it all right for a believer to drink alcoholic wine? Okay, so we are saying that what what wine can do to the unbeliever or any person physically by making them feel excited? He said the spirit can do the same. Verse nineteen, speaking to yourself when a person is full of the spirit, they will speak to themselves in psalms, singing hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you have you have prayed in tongues a lot, all of a sudden. You begin to burst out in songs. All of a sudden, some 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 worship songs that you have you have even forgotten. Some worship songs that you have even forgotten. All of a sudden, begins to pop up in your spirit. I don't know if you I don't know if, if you have experienced that before. I don't know if you have experienced that before. I I don't but I have experienced that. Or maybe 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 not even that. Maybe not even that. Not even that, but sometimes when you sleep, like maybe you spoke in tongues last night, when you wake up in the morning, all of a sudden there's this worship song that you know is coming out of your spirit. I don't know, if, I don't know if you have you have experienced that before. And then you begin to say, Oh, that song. Wow, I've even I've even forgotten it. That is the spirit, that's the spirit of God. That is the spirit of God. 
That is the spirit of God. So what Paul is saying here is that, what Paul is saying is that, what, the, what, what wine, that is why they always use wine as a symbolism. That's why they use wine as a symbolism in, in the Old Testament to mean the spirit. What they are just trying to say is that what the spirit, what the what wine can give you in terms of excitement or anything fleshly, the spirit can do the same and even better. So that is why I said that when you are filled with the spirit, this is the result. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is the effect of the having excess of the overflow of the spirit. Therefore, it is important to see that this wasn't an endorsement of taking alcohol or wine, as could almost be inferred or opined here. Neither can we say it is okay to do so as long as it is not in excess. Paul was teaching a spiritual truth and could never have intended, could have never have intended that we become wine advocates with measuring tools, though it is very much clear that no one can really, no one really can measure what is excess to everyone, like I said. See, you know, some, I, 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 you know, there are some, there are some ladies and there are some men who say that, as for me, I'm a very tough nut. I'm a tough nut, man. Give me the Jack Daniels. Whether it is 40%, I will not feel anything. Well, because the person has done it over time. So he, he has become numb to the levels of alcohol. You know, but that is not an endorsement. You see that? So for another person, it's, it's a different issue. Rather, what Paul was talking about here, about this using the wine, or, 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 or that, that anomaly was that he was teaching about the work in the spirit and the overwhelming influence of the spirit in dwelling us. Now, this is where we get to the nitty gritty. It is possible to argue that what Paul implied here was one can take wine as long as it does not get you drunk or it is not excessive, is the argument that a lot of believers put up. However, a vital question to ask from the above text is this. What is the excess? That's, that's what I want to deal with now. What is the excess? Or who determines what measure is excess? So this is where we got to last week. You know, and we came to First Timothy um, 3 2. But since we cannot determine the measure that is excess, then it is better to stay off. That is the wisdom. That is the wisdom there. You cannot determine. Well, somebody says, Well, you know, uh, you know, Pastor, you know, for me, I am I am cool, I can control myself. Yeah, but but somebody else. See, and, and and once again, the purpose is the purpose is think about the other, the other believer or the unbeliever. See that. Imagine you go to a wedding. And, 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 and then there's an, there's an unbeliever who knows you're a believer. Or there's a believer who is freshly born again, who in their mind, they know that it's a no-go area. Then you, for you, you think that, oh, me, I'm, I'm cool, you know. I'm, 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 a, a little wine will, will not matter. Maybe you, but think of the other person. What would that person say when they see you? You're, you're going to say, oh, wow, look at this matured believer. I could see it. Because they don't know that you have control over the excess. They don't know that. Or what about an unbeliever who knows you're a believer and for, for the unbelievers, they know that wine or, or alcoholic drink is a no-go area for if you're a Christian. So imagine the person sits at the wedding and spots you far at your table with a full bottle of wine. <laughs> now, you, you in your mind, you, are, you don't have a problem. But that person's conscience, see that? So we are not to think of our own good, but the good of the other person. So we came to First, first Timothy 3.2. We talk about anybody in leadership position in the church. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, up to teach, not given to. That means as a lifestyle. No striker. You don't beat, you don't beat women or you don't beat men. Not greedy for filthy lacquer, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. We talked about that. Okay. So an important observation to note from this text is that the apostle Paul was re-echoing Moses' instruction. To the priest that is when you come to leadership position okay we've talked about that the same thing was also talked about titus 1 7 for a bishop must be blameless a, a steward of the of god not self will not soon angry so all these are leadership qualities somebody who i mean if you're easily given to anger 
it's not, it's not a good place to be a leader. Not giving to wine, no striker. You don't beat people. Not giving to filthy lacquer. First, same thing. First Timothy 3 8. Likewise, must deacons, all those that are, apart from those who are in leadership position, they are people who serve in a form of they are not teaching, leading a class, you know, in terms of uh, uh, um, doctrine, you know, in that regard, but they serve in the church. They could be they could be assets, they could be um, they could be um, helping the administration. They could be helping in the children's department, etc. You know, we call these ones deacons, administrative service. They also, you know, they should not be grave, not double tongue, not giving too much wine. Okay. Now, once again, once again, somebody will argue and say, but Pastor Dead, he said that not giving too much wine so they can take some. That is the point we are trying to establish. That's the point we're trying to establish. That where is much and where is it not much? See, though it's not black and red and black, but where is much and where is not much? So once again, this text is not an endorsement of the consumption of wine. It was rather a description of the exemplary qualities that are expected of a bishop or a deacon in the local church. Now let us come to some cult cultures. Let's do some, some cultural aspects of it. Hallelujah. Now, there's a cultural fact that we cannot but discuss here. We must know that cultures, customs, or traditions have an impact on how people relate with or perceive things generally. This is also evident when it comes to the use of wine in the, in the scriptures. There are instances within the scriptures where wine was used for medicinal, curative, or restorative purposes. And this practice cuts across several cultures as well. So let us look at that. Let's look at an example. So there are situations where wine is not only drunk, but it has been used in cultures for medicine to cure or to restore. And it's across so many cultures. Okay. For example, because I, I, I because my background is, is in is in French and Spanish, I, I noticed that among the French and Spanish. For example, the French, you know, they normally have wine to go with almost any kind of meal that they have. You know, not everybody, but majority. You know, if you go to France and you go to places like Monaco, you know, they say that it's a, it's a, they, they say in French that that helps to digest the food. You know, and Spain as well. Spanish people too, they've got aperitif. You know, they have things that they take. They say it helps to digest the food. So they have a culture inbuilt. So for some people, they've grown in that culture. Then this person becomes born again, you see, and continues the practice based on culture, not as an attitude. So let us look at whether there are, there's any basis in that regard. Luke 10, 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed and came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So this is about the, the good Samaritan issue. Verse 34, and went to him when he was beaten by tags. And, a, and a, good, a man who was beaten and a good Samaritan came across him and bound up his wounds. And look at how, look at how he helped this man. And what did he do? Pouring in oil and wine on the wound of the beaten person. See that? And set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Here we see the Samaritan in a story or a parable told by Jesus using both oil and wine for restorative or curative purposes. Now let us come also into the epistles where Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. First Timothy 5.23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine. This is the favorite Bible verse that Pentecostals use a lot. First Timothy 5.23, drink no longer water. Now, why did he say drink no longer water? We explain but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So Timothy used to get a lot of um, digestive problems, okay? Timothy used to do that. Apparently, Timothy had regular stomach troubles. Why? In those days, don't forget, there was no pipe born water like we have today. There was no water treatment like we have, to, we have today. They didn't have 
that at, at all. There was nothing like pipe, faucet, tap. They didn't have anything like that. So for you to drink water, you have to fetch water from a stream, from a river, from a well. And because science had not developed, it could be contaminated. See that? It could be contaminated. Very important that we understand that. Okay? So Timothy had a lot of stomach problems and, pers and the personal medication Paul recommended to him was taking a little wine. However, note that this was a personal letter and the recommendation by Paul doesn't carry the weight of a doctor's prescription but shows his affection and concern for Timothy, his associate. Now, the above is just as literally impossible for anyone today to carry out Paul's instruction. This is similar to the verse below. Look at 2 Timothy 4.30. We are dealing with wine used in cultures or for medicinal purposes or curative purposes. 2 Timothy 4.13 the dress or the cloak that I left at Troas with a man called Capus. When thou comest, bring them with you and the books, but especially the parchments. We don't know the cloak he was talking about, nor do we have access to these parchments. This was not a doctrinal statement, rather a personal instruction to a close associate. In the same way, it will be out of place to literally refer to his personal recommendation to Timothy for his stomach troubles as an endorsement of wine for all believers. This was a non-doctrinal statement. That means it had nothing to do with what Jesus did, which neither carries doctrinal or medical weight. It, at its best, can only be used to show care for one another and the need to possibly address a frequent ailment by doing things in the natural that can stop the recurrence of such ailments. Therefore, as believers, whilst truly there are no scriptures that point to wine or alcohol as sinful, did you see that? You see that? You see, you see what we are trying to drive at? There is no scripture. There is no scripture that points to wine or alcohol as sinful. Neither. There is no Bible verse that shows that taking wine or alcohol will make you lose your salvation However, we have God's wisdom in his word that guides us and points us to a greater import or a greater meaning of the use of the word wine with respect or relative to the spirit in us and its overwhelming influence in and through us. So the figure of speech of wine is not an endorsement to take it. Rather, when it is used, it is pointing to the influence of the spirit, just like when wine influences a person's habit in the natural, the writers used it to use it as a parallel to talk about that in the same way when a person takes wine and they are jumpy up and down and they are out of control, so to speak, so also the spirit, when it takes possession of you, makes you to be passionate about the things of Christ. Just as when a person takes wine, they are passionate about silly things like dancing, shouting, jumping up and down, laughter, and all that. So also, when you are full of the spirit, you are full of the passion for Christ. That is what they are driving at. Can you see that? Though there is no explicit word that says that taking wine is a sin. 
or you will lose your salvation. But the import is about the spirit indwelling the believer. So what we are clearly instructed to do is to walk in the spirit. Walk according to your born again nature and not be drunk with wine. The spirit's influence in and through us should be our focus. So to do an exegesis, that is to go into what is already explained in the Bible for the consumption of wine or alcohol with the scriptures, particularly the Ephesians text, will be to leave the weightier matters of the scriptures, which is to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Yes, in Christ we are free. There is no sin. There is, there is, there, God will not count any sin against us, no matter what we do. But look at the advice. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then the verse 24 of Galatians 5. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with, the, with its affections and lust. Verse 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Truly, we have liberty in Christ. Yet that liberty is to serve one another in love. What that means is that anything you do, don't think of only you yourself, what you are going to gain. I am at a wedding. I am at a party. Okay, let's, 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 be, let's be open. Maybe I take wine once in a little while. I'm, I'm giving an example. Let's say the person takes wine once in a little while. But when I got to the wedding, I realized that there were some unbelieving friends who I know. And there are some believing friends who are new in Christ. You see that? But because I saw the bottle, I didn't. I was thinking about myself. That oh, what? What is it? Let, let them let them see it. I don't care. That is not walking in love. That is not walking in love. So you have to consider. You have to consider. You have to consider the conscience of the unbeliever, the conscience of the new, the baby Christian. So we have liberty in Christ. Yes. Yet, that liberty is to serve one another in love, which is where I, we, consider the greater good of all, even in that which we allow or practice. You see that? So even if it's something that you do, but for the sake of the unbeliever in that wedding, for the sake of that unbeliever, or of, that, of that baby Christian in that wedding, at that party, then abstain for conscience sake, so that they don't, they don't, they don't judge you with everybody. Look, unbelievers here, yeah, even though they know that unbelievers, unbelievers, you see them like that, they, they know some truth. For example, unbeliever, even though he's not a believer, knows that a Christian should not take alcohol. So imagine at a wedding, even though you, maybe your culture allows you to take it bit by bit as a born again Christian. What do you think the unbeliever would think in their mind? when they see you freely pouring the red, red wine. It shocks them. It shocks them. You see that they'll start talking among themselves. Hey, but I thought, I thought he was a Christian. I thought she was a Christian. I can't believe it. Then they'll end up and say, oh, you see, that is why me, I don't believe, I don't, I don't, I don't trust these Christians. I know her, I know her, I know him. I know him, you see. But you probably, you don't have any problem. But the unbeliever even knows a bit better that, wow. Then what about the, the new convert who looks up to you and in that wedding was also invited, sitting in some corner. And he said, ah, I saw Marilyn. See that? So we have to think about what? The greater good. The greater good. So, we have liberty in Christ, all right, yes. Yet that liberty is to serve one another in love, which is where we consider the greater good of all. 
even in that which I allow, even in that we allow, but for the sake of the greater good in a party, in a wedding, in a, in, in, in a restaurant, for the sake of a greater good, just, just walk in wisdom. All of which is encompassed in my walk in the spirit. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll drop it here because maybe this is another one where it also comes. Okay, maybe I'll deal with this a little bit. What about smoking? It's also another popular question. What about smoking? That we know, we know I'll try even biologically, scientifically, is not good for your health. That one, we all know it. Okay, so but once again, for the sake of, of, of clarity, somebody will say, but the Bible does not put any clear word that we should not smoke. I remember when I came here, when I came here the very first time, you know, so many years ago. And one day I was, um, uh, we, 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 the, the church that I was, I was attached as an associate pastor to help them, there was also another church, I think Church of England or something close by. And, <laughs> and when we finished church, you know, of course, I'm not mentioning him, so you don't know who I'm even talking about. I don't even know his name. I saw this, they call them here, they call them here, Vika. Coming out of the church and at the entrance, he lit his cigarette and he was smoking. I said, eh? Eh? The vicar, the vicar was smoking. <laughs> the argument is, there is nowhere in the Bible that says that we should not smoke. Okay, so let's let's quickly delve into that and see, let's see what we have, any, any doctrinal basis on that. Let, let's look at that. Well, now, this smoking, this is defined by the English dictionary as the burning and inhalation of tobacco. By extension, the burning and inhalation of other substances. Example, marijuana, which has got so many names. You know, marijuana, weed, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Indian hemp, uh, it has got us, every country has got its names, you know, in, 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 in different languages, you know. So I'll, I'll not go into that. You know what I'm talking about. Firstly, it goes without saying that there are serious health concerns or health related issues that may arise from smoking as an act or addiction. It is quite a valid and legitimate concern for anyone to have with respect to one's health or health hazards, okay? That could arise from smoking. This is loudly emphasized even by the governments of different nations and the manufacturers of these substances themselves. I mean, you see on a cigarette package, they've clearly written it will damage your health. That said, let us consider this a bit more closely. In the teaching of God's word, the believer is to be shown the reality the reality of Christianity with strong emphasis on righteousness as a new Christian reality. In the same way, believers are taught are to be taught strongly that they must also walk in the spirit and walk in love. So on the one hand, a well-taught believer has a firm grasp of proper Bible interpretation to the end that such can readily say that there are no scriptures or Bible texts that endorse or condemn smoking as an act. Yet, an equally sound and well-taught believer knows to be loud where the scriptures are loud and to be silent where the scriptures are silent. So what that means is that, you know, there are some, there are some gray areas in the Bible where there is no clear Bible verse to say, this is wrong, this is right. So we are silent when the Bible is silent on some things. We are loud when the Bible is loud on some things is what I'm just trying to say. This, in effect, will imply that if the Bible or the scriptures were not loud, but silent about smoking, what will come to play in our knowledge and practice of God's word will be to see clearly that the scriptures are loud on being exemplary as believers. So even though the Bible does not give us a clear Bible verse that smoking is wrong, but one of our work as a believer is to be an example to the world. When we know that even though there's no clear Bible verse, but even the wealthy people know that smoking is dangerous to your health. See that? So our work is to be exemplary as believers. 
and to consider others in all of my actions. So when I am doing something as a believer, consider the unbeliever, consider society, consider the baby Christian. This again brings in our earlier teaching on the conscience. That is, as believers, we cannot live without respect or regard for fellow believers whose conscience might be wounded or whose Christian work or growth might become stunted by our actions. See, that is very, very, very important. So, well, of course, someone can say there is no Bible verse, like, like, like the vicar. The vicar is here in, 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 the, in Europe or in the UK. V-I-C-I is what we call a priest in a, in a Protestant church. I saw this white priest coming out of the building after, his, after he has done all he had to do and smoking. And, that, and, and, and coming from Africa, that shocked me because even though, you know, there's no Bible verse, I knew that there was something wrong for him being a leader and, and smoking. How can you reconcile the two? Therefore, even though the scriptures do not expressly say smoking is sinful in itself, the believer must not shy away from the fact that scriptures teach that if actions like smoking causes another believer to stumble or wound their conscience, then I have sinned against Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. See, they are, when, when he says weak, you know, uh, uh, they have not come to know what you know. You know, you have come to know that you cannot lose your salvation. You have come to know that no matter what you do, God is not going, you are not going to lose your salvation and God will not count any sin against you because you have matured in that understanding. But then the newborn baby Christian, who doesn't know these facts and is afraid that they'll lose their salvation, they have not gotten that. If you, you, you have the understanding, so it gives you liberty. But that liberty, he said, take heed lest by any means this liberty of understanding of yours becomes what? A stumbling block to them that are weak. Weak how? Weak in their understanding of who they are in Christ. Can you see that? Verse 10. For if any man see thee which has knowledge. So now he's going to bring a, a practice in, in, the, in, the, in the Corinthian era. For if any man see that which has knowledge, you that are matured in Christ, you that you know that salvation is eternal, you that you know that you can never lose your salvation. And no matter what you do, God will never count it against you. You sit at a meat of food in idol's temple. Huh? You, you know that you know that I do, I do that is nothing. But this guy does not know. He hasn't got that knowledge. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak. You see that? This is a, this, this is a very, very good teaching. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? The person will see you eating the person saw that they had sacrificed the meat to idols. It was on the altar. Then they collected the meat. They cooked it and they presented it as food. He was there. He know it has been sacrificed to idols. Then you, a believer, you're a matured one. You know that, oh, this man, nothing can happen to me. But he doesn't know that. So for the sake of him, you refrain. It's the same thing. An unbeliever knows that a believer is not supposed to smoke. Though there is no Bible verse. A believer is not supposed to drink alcohol, though it is not clear. But in their conscience, they see you doing that. What do you think they will say? You are going to give them now the line say, ah, oh, I see. Then me too. Verse 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish from whom Christ died. You see that? What it means perish is that now the person... If the person had boundaries, for the example, the person is a, a, a baby Christian and he knows that he shouldn't do those things because he doesn't have the knowledge, 
all of a sudden the person will say, okay, I saw Sister Mina doing it. So me too, I will do it. That's what he meant by verse 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother in Christ perish for whom Christ died. See, just like, just like if, if a believer, you know, is going out with an unbeliever, you, you have lost the chance to preach the gospel to them because the person is going to be, I mean, unbelievers, they, you know, you see them like that, but they are smart, you know. They'll be shocked that you are a believer. I'm an unbeliever, even though they know that there's no correlation. And they see that, you know, you have, you have given them opportunity. You know, they, 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 they question, when they go back in their house, they say, they'll tell their friends, ah, ah, this person said that he's a believer, but I'm surprised. See that? So for the sake of them, but when you sin so against the brothers and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Verse 13. So look at the advice. Wherefore, if meat, he's using meat as just an example, make my brother to offend. What it means that if, uh, if what I see as there's nothing wrong with it, for me, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. But I am now doing it openly for the unbeliever to see. Or the, or, the, or the brother in Christ who is, you know, who is young in the things of God to see. He said that, wherefore, if I if meat make my brother a friend, you know, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. That means in open view, then I will not do it. At the wedding, even though maybe the person has got the person that, oh, you know, I, I, I don't drink wine in excess, but once in a while. But once I know that they know, I've got friends that came to the wedding. I've got friends that came to the party. They know that I'm a believer. They know that I am shibara babaya baya. You know, for the sake of their conscience, if they put the red bottle before me, I will not take it. That's what Paul is saying. Wherefore, if meat may make my brother to offend, I will, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. You see that? Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, yes. I, I know that Christ was not angry with me. I know that, uh, I know very well that no, uh, you know, I'll, I'll not lose my salvation. I know I have liberty, yes. Yes, I know that all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. That means it's not that because it's that so everywhere that I am free to do it. I have to ask myself, is it necessary? What about the people around? What would they think? All things are lawful for me. Yes, but all things do not edify. Yes, yes, I am free. Christ will not be angry. I will not lose my salvation. But what I am doing, remember that my main aim is to win souls. So what I am doing, in the, in, in, whether at my workplace, whether among unbelievers, at that party, is that going to give a people reason, people reason to think that, you know, really, is that how Christianity is? Will that open the door for me to be able to share the gospel or to close the door? That is what he means by, but all things edify not. Verse 24, let no man seek his own. He brings the same thing again. But every man another's wealth is what he's emphasizing. Don't think only of yourself. Think also of others. I must consciously seek the wealth. That word, well, well-being of others even in things that I am personally persuaded as of as legitimate. Yes, it might be legitimate. It might be legit. But because of others who don't understand or who know what I know, such things become sinful when they cause others to sin. Again, the issue of conscience cannot be overemphasized because there is a widespread perception of smoking that I cannot ignore. It is in the news, billboards, adverts. It's largely perceived and associated with many other things that the Bible would readily describe as lascivious, wanton, lewd, and lustful. Smoking cannot be readily placed side by side with spiritual activities or as a good representation of a spiritual man. 
a salient illustration would be to generally ask oneself as a believer or much more as a Christian leader, will I be teaching Christ to my disciples by smoking? No, imagine me, Pastor Fred. <laughs> imagine me, imagine me, Pastor Fred. As I am teaching you, I am smoking. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine? You know, what, what is that? See? Under what guise or text, the unbeliever even knows that something is wrong with that. Under what guise or text will I be able to explain it away as glorifying to the Lord or even as edifying to oneself? On a much larger scale is to consider the implications of such endorsement to one's disciples, people whom you are responsible for in the Lord, many of whom could be young, younger people who are prone to take things to the next level. It is safe to say that such endorsement can only lead to much harm than good as one would no longer be able to control the narratives when it leads to more harmful addictions such as the consumption of hard drugs accompanied with all its evils and ills. So let us carefully see these words from Paul's letter to the Romans and we close. Romans chapter 14, verse 20. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things are indeed pure. So there is not, I mean, he's talking about food, meat. Because up to now, some people think that eating pork is wrong. He said that no, meat, meat cannot destroy salvation. Eating pork or not eating pork will not destroy salvation. We know, he's making a point. Drinking, drinking wine or not drinking wine or, or smoking will not destroy your work in salvation. We know that. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But it is evil for the man who eat it with offense. Verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbled or is offended or is made weak. You see that now? By the, by the eating of the meat offered to idols or by eating of meat that is maybe harem or by, or by smoking or drinking wine, you know, that by your action, a brother will stumble. A brother will be offended or a brother will now be weak in their, in their conscience. Verse 22. Has thou faith, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. So whether it is wine, whether it is alcohol, whether it's tobacco or anything else, if it will cause my brother in Christ to stumble, to be offended or be made weak, I cannot in good conscience permit or practice such. I think the explanation is clear. Amen. Next week, we shall consider this question, whether a Christian can be homosexual or transgender. We'll deal with that as well. Any questions? Hallelujah.